You guys are excited this morning. Listen, I'm, I'm really looking forward to today, really looking forward to the, the series. And, um, you know, this is something, and they're, they're going to, they're messing with me upstairs. They're going to, this is something that I thought, like, okay, we've just come out of a long series of, of working on changing our habits and, and that sort of thing. And then in between that was Easter and a couple other things. And I thought for the next couple of weeks, like, let's, let's have fun. Uh, there, there is going to be a lot that you can take away and a lot that you can apply to yourself. But also, like the, the Bible is, is fun for me. And, and there's a lot of really kind of cool, interesting things in there. And so my, my hope is that over this week and next week and the week after, that, that you walk out of here and you just have had fun with hearing about like what's in God's Word. And so that's what we're going to try and do today. I do want to kind of warn you up front. Um, I do hope that you have a, a strong stomach this morning. Um, uh, and you'll, you'll see why here in just a minute. But today's message, the title of today's message is Contemplating Homicide with a Tent Peg. That's, 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 that's it, you know. I've been listening to a lot of true crime podcasts. Anybody else into those? Yeah, you know, it's like, those are like a drug, man. Uh, when Dateline puts a new podcast out, I'm like, I gotta have it. So Contemplating Homicide with a Tent Peg. That's what today is about. And in order for that to kind of make sense to you, we're going to go all the way back, and, and what we're going to be talking about is the people of Israel. Now, Israel was God's chosen people. And, and if you don't kind of know all of that, if, you know, I don't want to lose anybody on this, but we're going to move kind of quick. But think about Abraham when you, when you think of Israel. Abraham was hanging out, couldn't have kids, looking up at the stars. Him and God had this account, encounter, and God said, I'm going to make you know, your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And what he was talking about was that from Abraham would come God's chosen people. And God's chosen people would end up becoming the nation of Israel. Now, because they were God's chosen people, they would get God's protection. They would have God's presence with them. They would have sort of the guarantee of a promise that God would love them and pursue them. And I just can't think of a more kind of secure and enduring relationship than, than that. You know, to have the Heavenly Father, to have God just say, you are my people, my chosen, chosen people. And Israel was given a few rules that they had to follow, you know, not many, but they had some things that they had to follow. And all Israel had to do was follow those rules. And, and God was with them. I mean, when we talk about Moses leading Israel out of uh, Egypt, you know, he parted the Red Sea for them. He, he hid them in a cloud so, so that uh, Pharaoh's army couldn't find them. There's all kinds of amazing things that would happen. And you would think that Israel would just be like on fire for God and they would just be a, a model citizen of, of God's chosen person. But they weren't. Instead, Israel instead was just plain bad. It, it, they were horrible. They doubted God after every miracle. They complained. Even though God was giving them free food every single morning, they would wake up. They'd have manna on the ground. They could collect it every day. They, they couldn't collect more than they could eat in a day because God wanted to make sure that they had fresh food to eat every single day, and they put their faith in Him. And, and even after all of that is, is done, even after all the miracles that they went through, they still doubted God. It's like they still pursued other, other gods and other religions. In fact... When Moses, so Moses is leading these people for 40 years through a desert on what is essentially like a less than a one month kind of trip, a walk, but it took them 40 years to get through it because they couldn't obey God. It's like, you know, when we put Benjamin in time out and for Benjamin, time out is really just a cool down. It's, it's less about him being in trouble and more about him just kind of cooling down and calming down. And we explain like, listen, bro, if you just cool down and relax, you're out of here in like a minute. But every time, you know, he, it, the more that he continues to, you know, fight or throw or, or be upset or whatever, it's okay, we got, it's going to take you longer to cool down. That's the way I think about Israel walking around in the desert. God's just walking them in circles because they're just, they're bad. They're not being very good. And so what happens is, is Israel, they, they have Moses. Moses leads them to a point where they almost step into the promised land. And then Moses, he, he lets his pride take over, and he has this, this he kind of uh, tries to take the position of God by striking a rock and get, getting water from it. You know, that's a story in and of itself. And so God says, Moses, you know, sorry, you can't come into the promised land. And then his sort of protege steps up, 
And, and Joshua steps in, and he takes them over into the promised land. And so now the nation of Israel has walked into the promised land, and God tells them to conquer and kill everybody. He says, just wipe the whole uh, of the promised land completely clean. Kill all the Canaanites. Kill, just go in and slaughter everyone. But they don't do that because when they get in there, they realize that, like, oh, these people, these cities, like, they actually have infrastructure. They're pretty nice. And, and actually, like, all their gods revolve around some kind of, like, uh, how do I, I don't know how many kids are in here this morning, but you know, parents, they, there's a, you know, all their gods have to do with fertility. And the Israelites are like, we, we can't, that's cool. We like that, you know. That's, we can celebrate fertility. It's like worshiping God. So the Israelites keep, you know, drifting in that direction. So what God does is God says, okay, from the time that Joshua dies up until the time that you get Samuel, who, who is uh, a prophet, and he actually is the guy that helps Saul become king, and then David. So Samuel's really important later in the Bible. There's this gap, all right, this gap of time. And in this gap of time, Israel needs somebody to just interact between them and God. Okay, so that's where we are. There's bad Israel, there's good God, and God is saying, I, you guys are a mess. I've got to put somebody with you that can help you out. And so what, what God does is he appoints judges. So they're quite literally, these are, are people that are, are put in charge of Israel, over Israel, and they, they help judge Israel. And they've been called judges. And now there's 12 judges in total. And of these 12 judges, it, they, you'll see the same pattern repeat over and over and over again. And that pattern is this. Israel, they do bad things. And so what God does is he lets another nation conquer Israel. Now, if Israel had done what they were told to do in the beginning, slaughter everybody in the land, there would be no other nation to conquer Israel. But because they didn't do that, God says, okay, fine, you left them. So guess what? They've come in and they conquer Israel. Then Israel complains and they whine and they say, oh, this oppression is so bad. You know, we're being oppressed. God, can't you hear our cry? And God hears their cry. And when God hears their cry, he appoints a judge. The judge comes in, and they help take care of Israel. They're almost like a civil leader. They give advice, but then they also kind of help lead in a military sense. And then they, they set Israel free. Then Israel lives for a few years, sometimes 80, sometimes 20. And then they drift right back into the bad stuff. And so God says, okay, you got to be dependent on me. you got to worship me alone. I'm going to have to put you in time out. And so then God lets another nation conquer Israel. And so Israel gets conquered. They spend 20 years or they spend 80 years. They spend a period of time just being conquered by somebody. And then they start whining again. And then God's like, oh, you guys are whining already. So then God gives them another judge. This happens, this happens 12 times, okay? You would think that they would pick up on the pattern and say, hey, let's stop doing bad stuff. But they actually never do. In fact, over the 12 judges, you think about 12 different judges coming in, Israel just gets worse. So it's, it's going in reverse. It's happening where instead of they're getting better and learning their lesson, they're getting worse and worse. So that brings us to there's a special judge, judge number four. We're skipping the first three, and we're going straight into number four. So judge number four is a lady named Deborah. And honeybee here is not just like something her husband called her. That's what her, that's what her name translated it into. Now, do we have any? I know a lot of us are like, hey, babe, or hey, sugar, hey, sweetie. Anybody here a, a honeybee? Anybody here call their significant other? Like, hey, honeybee, you know? So <laughs> I was going to make a joke. I decided not to. So Deborah, Deborah, her, her name is honeybee. It's what it translates to. And so... Deborah is special. She's a special judge for, for a couple reasons, all right? So for one, Deborah is the first female judge. She's the first woman judge, and she actually is the only female judge. And th this is kind of, you know, surprising because, you know, a lot of us are wondering, can, can women be in leadership? Can they not be in leadership? Who are they under? Yada, yada, yada. Well, here we have God is, okay, Deborah is a judge. And in fact, Deborah is also a, a prophetess. Now, what that means is she's a female version of a prophet. Now, there are only two people in the Bible 
that are judges and prophets at the same time. And that's Samuel and Deborah. Now, Samuel is the guy that is like, he's the bomb. He's got this reputation for putting Saul in charge, for disciplining Saul, for, for anointing David as the, the king after Saul. And then Jesus comes from David. Samuel's like, he's, he's quite an amazing person. And Deborah is right up there with Samuel. And so also, this is quite, quite interesting, quite amazing. Deborah is the only woman in the Bible that is not defined by a, re- a relationship with a man. It's like, come on, independent ladies, represent. You know? Yeah. Deborah, Deborah, Deborah doesn't need a man to define who she is, a man to define her relationship. No, she is married, but, but Deborah is recognized for who she is and what she is, and not for being so-and-so's husband or so-and-so's wife or a, a prostitute or, or anything like that. She's just not defined by any relationship with the man. And then Deborah, she owned a tree farm. We're going to talk about that later where she's sitting under a palm tree, which means that she was wealthy, she had land, she knew how to run a business. I mean, just lots of amazing things about her. And then she was also known to be one of the closest to God. So here we have a picture of Deborah. Deborah's Deborah's a judge. She is going to eventually kind of free Israel. She's going to help Israel out of captivity but, but she's this, this model judge that we're going to look at. But before we look at Deborah, first what I want to do is I want to talk about judge number two. I'm just going to tell you a quick story about judge number two. And his name is Ehud. And then in this period of time, Israel is underneath the control of the Moabites. So there's, that's just another one of the 12 versions of another nation conquering Israel. And so Israel's being conquered by the Moabites, and they start complaining. And so God says, okay, Ehud, you're going to be the judge. And he puts Ehud in charge, and he decides, okay, I'm going to free Israel. And he does this in, in such like, a, like an interesting way. We'll just call it interesting. You can make up your own mind about it here in a second. But let's look at what, what the Scripture says here in Judges about this. And so in verse 15, it says in chapter 3, But when the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help, they're whining because they've been conquered, even though it's their own fault. The Lord, he raised up a man to rescue them. That's Ehud. And he was the son of Gera, a Benjamite, so from the tribe. Now, he was a left-handed man. This is significant because what Ehud does is he makes a dagger. And it says in the Bible, it's a, it's a double-sided dagger. And it's, it's about this long, okay? And what he does is he straps it to the inside of his right thigh. And the reason he does that, the reason it's significant that he's left-handed is because when Ehud would go through like TSA, like the airport checkpoint, when they would pat them down, they would only pat down kind of one side because most people were right-handed, so if they were to draw a sword, they would draw it from, from the left side because they're right-handed. So they would just pat one side down and say, okay, you can, you're fine, you can go through. But because he's left-handed, the, that little dagger that he made is on his right side. And so he's got that strapped to him. And what Israel has to do is they have to pay a tribute to this king kind of every month. And so what Ehud does is he says, okay, here, here we go. He gets people together, organizes the tribute. And he brings it to the, the king of Moab, the, the, the Moabite king. And he goes in and, and they, have this, um, they have this exchange where, where he had kind of delivers this thing. And, and he, he, he delivers the tribute. I don't know exactly how he pulls this off. He tells everybody to leave the room. So they leave the room. And then he, he says some more things to the king. And then he walks away. But then he comes back, and he says, hang on a second, God has a secret for you. And the, the king's like, okay. And he says, no, God has a secret for you. He wants to tell you a secret. How many of you try that with your kids? Hey, I've got a secret to tell you. Come here, you know. Kids know it. They see right through you. They're like, mm-mm, nope. You want me to do something that I don't want to do. But this guy, Eglon, he says, okay, and he stands up. Stands up and approaches him. So what he does is he reaches out with his left hand. He takes a sword from his right thigh and he plunged it into Eglon's belly. 
And the hilt, so that thing on the, on the dagger that would keep your hand from sliding up it uh, and cutting your own hand. So that hilt also went in after the blade. Because, see, this, this, this king was like obese. He was, he was huge. I, I like to think about, I don't know if anyone saw the movie Dune when it came out, the new one. That weird uh, guy that looks like a big worm, you know. But th- this is what I think about when I think of Eglon. And so he, he, he stabs him, and he's so big that the, the dagger just goes straight through, the handle goes straight through, and it actually says the fat closed over the blade. So it just completely disappeared. So if you think like 18 inches, go home in front of the mirror and turn sideways and do this, and that'll tell you where the blade, if it would go through and come out on the other side or not. So it goes through the blade. Now after this, what ends up happening is because... Uh, Ehud did not draw out the sword because he didn't draw it out of his belly. And, and then the, this word refuse came out. So that's like his entrails or maybe like he had a, maybe had a bowel movement or, you know, when that happened, you know. So who's going to lunch after this? You know, uh, we're serving chocolate cupcakes right after the service today. No. So, I mean, I, this, is, this is crazy stuff. So he stabs him and, th- you know, stuff happens. And so then Ehud, he, he goes up to the vestibule, and he, so he goes up to this upper room where it's nice and cool, and that's where this happened. He shuts the doors to the chamber behind him, and he, he locks those doors, and then he disappears. So this guy basically John Wicked uh, Eglon the king, <laughs> and now he disappears. Now this is what gets really interesting. The next thing that happens here, we read in verse 24, he departs. Now Eglon's servants, they, they come. And when they saw that the doors to the upper room were locked, they, they said, this is in the Bible, he, he's only relieving himself in the cool room. Basically, they thought he was, he was going to the bathroom. And so they waited a very, very long time. Now, there were no cell phones. There wasn't Angry Birds. There wasn't anything to do while you're in the bathroom. And so they're like, okay, you're going to wait for a while here. But eventually, they became embarrassed and uneasy. So they're like, man, this guy's been in there for a long time. And so he still didn't open the doors to the room. So his guards are like, what, what is going on in there? And so finally, they took the key and they opened the doors. And they're like, you know, and behold, their master had fallen dead to the floor. Now, they, they ended up not being able to capture Ehud because he had disappeared. And after this, it would lead to the Israelites becoming free. This would kind of kick that off. Now, that's, that's, that's judge number two. Now, judge number three, we're just going to skip over because he wasn't even an Israelite. He, he came from a different tribe. Basically, the Bible gives him like two verses. He comes in, he kills a bunch of Philistines, and that's the end of his story. But then that brings us to Deborah. So what Deborah inherits is Deborah inherits an Israel that has come out of kind of Ehud freeing them and from the story of Ehud taking over. And so the, the situation that Deborah inherits is that Israel has backslidden from that. And they they have now gone back into oppression. Instead of being oppressed by the Moabites, they're oppressed by the Canaanites. And there's a a certain king of Canaan, and his name is Jabin. So I tried to make this very simple for us to follow. Jabin the Canaanite, he's the king. So he's the king of the people that are being mean to Israel. They're oppressing Israel. They're just making life horrible for Israel. Israel's being conquered by them. And he has a general of his army named Sisera. Sisera's whole purpose was to lead the army that just oppressed Israel. So there is a dedicated system for oppressing Israel by the Canaanite people. That's Sisera's role. Now, Sisera has, this is kind of how they bargain, you know, this, or not bargain, but brag. Sisera brags that he has 900 iron chariots. Now, this is significant because that means that they were technologically advanced. That means that they were advanced in the resources that they had. They were advanced in, like, the money that they had, and even the people that they had to, to be a part of their army. It was like 900 of these iron chariots. No one else had iron chariots. If we don't know what a chariot is, it's a horse, and then it's a buggy thing, and it's made of iron. Uh, Some of them were made of wood, and the people would ride on that, and they would go into battle, and they would attack through. through. It's kind of like a modern-day tank. And so Israel has been under 20 years of oppression 
by a nation that's more advanced than them, by a general whose sole purpose is to make them miserable and oppress them, and by a king who has conquered their nation. That's where Deborah picks up our story here. And so we're going to look here at Judges chapter 4. We're going to read the story of Deborah. And I'll kind of get into it a little bit. Now, this is, this is amazing stuff. You know, me sharing what Ehud did was to, was to just kind of pique your interest. Like the Bible is pretty cool. It has a lot of neat stuff in it. It's got stuff in it. It's like, man, I, I cannot believe that that's in the Bible. Hence the name of this series here. So now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. So this is the story. She's judging Israel. She used to sit to hear and decide disputes under the palm tree of Deborah. So this is part of her, the land that she owns and the, the trees that she owns. And so this was located between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. So that's Deborah. That's where she is. That's what she's doing. She's judging Israel. She's helping to solve Disputes, And then it goes on here after this, and it says, And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. So they would come. So she's quite literally judging Israel. And a lot of this is like civil cases. Like, you know, they built too close to my wall, and their dog barks all night. And, you know, they had a matric party, and I had to get up early and work. And, I mean, it's like the, the Pinelands 531 would just have... A permanent line right here, you know, of people. They have to make their own section for them to approach Deborah. So now, so the Israelites come up, they're judging. So Deborah knows that they're oppressed. And she's been just talking to them. She's been judging them. But she also wants, wants them to be free. That's her purpose as a judge. So she sends word and she summons a guy named Barak. Now, Barak is... The, is the general of their army. So Sisera was the general of Jabin's army. Barak is the general of the Israelites' army. And so she summons Barak to come over to him. And what she says to him is she rolls out the plan for how Israel is going to be set free. So she says in the next verse, she says, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded... Now, the judge was the person that heard from God on behalf of Israel... So when Deborah says, behold, the God of Israel, she's heard God and she's being obedient to what God has said. So she says, he's commanded to go and march to Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men. That's, that's a lot of people. So you're going to get 10,000 men of war from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun. You're going to go to war with those people. Then she says in the next verse, she takes some ownership here. She says, I, Deborah will draw out Sisera, because he's the commander. I'm going to draw him out. I'm going to pull him away from his army. And with his chariots and his infantry, uh, to meet you at the river Kishon. Now, this is important. This shows just how smart Deborah is. Remember, they, Sisera has 900 iron chariots. It's also said that he has 300,000 soldiers, and that he has another 10,000 regular chariots. That's a lot of horses, that's a lot of people, that's a lot of military. So what, what would be the worst way to fight a tank? You definitely don't want to fight against a tank in a huge open field or a huge valley where you're boxed in by walls. That would be a bad idea. So Deborah says, I want you to go up to Mount Tabor, which is the high ground. So they're going to get high ground. And they're going to be looking down, they're going to have a bit of an advantage over their army. But then Deborah changes that. She adds another section to it. She says, no, it, the battle is actually going to be down at the river. Well, that's a bad idea because that's the valley. So the, the horses and the chariots would be able to just overcome them. But she heard from God, and that's what, that's what she says. And so now Barak says to her, okay, not a great plan, but if you go with me, then I'll go. So he's like, put, put your money where your mouth is. If you go with me into this suicide mission, then I'll go as well. And then he says, if you don't go with me, then I will not go. Now, we don't exactly know if Barack is just like uh, testing Deborah. We don't know if he's being disobedient or maybe he's being super honoring. And he's saying, you're the one that hears from God. So I want to make sure that you're with me. Well, we don't exactly know what tone Barak was holding there, but he says, I'm going if you go. 
If you don't go, I'm not going. And Deborah says, okay, I certainly will go with you. Nevertheless, the journey that you are about to take will not be for your honor and your glory. So Barak, you're not going to get credit for what's going to happen when you go to battle against Sisera. And she says, because the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. This is all about just these amazing women in this story here. So then she goes on here to tell him, Then Deborah got up, and she went to Barak. She went with Barak to Kadesh, and Barak summoned the fighting men of the tribes, and 10,000 men went up under his command. And Deborah, she also goes up with him. And so now we, we get to a, a section of the story that kind of doesn't make sense. So let me kind of sum up where we've come to at this point here. You've got uh, the Israelites who've been under oppression. You've got Deborah, who's trying to set them free. She brings her, her general in. This general, she gives a plan. You're going to go up to the high ground, yeah, and then you're going to go down to the worst place possible, and you're going to fight. And you're going to bring 10,000 people with you. And so he says, fine. So Deborah and him, they go together, they get the 10,000 men, and they go up to the Mount of uh, of Tabor. They go up to the mountaintop. So that's where we are now. And then all of a sudden, the Bible puts this kind of weird verse in here. And, and it's in verse 11. This kind of comes out of nowhere. And it just says, it's kind of like pausing the story. And it says, now, Heber the Kenite had separated himself from the Kenites, from the sons of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. He had pitched his tent as far away from the Terebinth, which is a, like an oak tree in Zananim. These are the worst words for uh, an American to try and figure out how to say here. And so, why is this in here? Well, the, the Kenites, they were a desert tribe. So they lived in the desert in between kind of uh, South Palestine and uh, the Sinai Mountains. And they lived in this area. And they were, I don't know if you have any like um, war buffs in here or people super caught up on current events. They were like the Switzerland of the time because they were neutral. So they supported the Israelites, they gave them aid, they helped them through the desert, and they also kind of had like a really good relationship with Javan and the Canaanites. And, and they're just big enough that they have a significant presence. Now what, what's significant is Moses' father-in-law comes from this tribe. And the Bible's kind of laying out that, hey, I'm telling you this story, and by the way, just keep in the back of your mind that there's these people over here that remain neutral, that kind of support both, but don't get involved in either one, which is why they're nicknamed, I've nicknamed them the Switzerland of, of the Bible. And I just want to make you aware that there's, there's these people over here. So you log that in the back of your brain, and we continue on with the story here. And so someone tells Sisera what, what's happening, that Barak is building this army. And sister is like, okay, you want to you wanna step to me? I'm going to step to you. And so what Sisera does is, is he goes out and he calls together all of his chariots, his 900 chariots, and all the people who are with him from another horrible word for me to say, Herosheth Hagoyim. That's pretty close. And they go down to the river of Kishon. So here's the setting. You've got Israel up on the mountain. And just like we thought, um, Sisera takes all of his tanks and his army and his people and his iron chariots and everything, and they go down in the valley, because obviously that's going to be the best place for them to fight from. And so that's the stage. Now what we learn later is that God had previously caused a flash flood in that valley. Now what happens when you try and drive on soft, muddy ground? You get nowhere. So imagine an iron chariot on soft muddy ground it's not going to be super effective maybe that's why deborah says you're going to go down and fight by the river because god had said hey there's i'm going to flood this or maybe god didn't say it at all maybe god just said here's the plan and deborah said okay and it didn't matter what god was going to do or not because she knew that god was on their side we don't know the answer to that but what we do know is that 
uh, Sisera's army is down there. And so then Deborah, when he sees him down there, Deborah gives the command to Barak. She says, Arise, for this is the day when the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Has the Lord not gone out before you? Flash flood. So Barak went down from the mountain with 10,000 men following him. So they just brave heart this thing. They charge, you know, and Barak is, is uh, playing the role of Mel Gibson, and he gets them all charged up, and they come just storming down this mountain into this valley where they should be slaughtered. But God had gone before them and had already done something in that area. And so they're charging down there. And then something so interesting happens here. And it's, and the Lord here in, in verse 15, it says, and the Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots. Well, what they mean by this word routed is basically all the horses went crazy. And they all just kind of went like wild. And so you've got all these, these people on horseback and in chariots, in iron chariots, where they can't really go anywhere, the horses go crazy. And they start running into each other. They start dispersing all over. The army just goes wild. It just looks like, like, a, like, like a, just a mess. And um, Barak comes down with his army into this. God has gone before. He's messed with the minds of all these crazy horses. And then, even more than that, he confused all the army with the edge of the sword before Barak and Sisera dismounted from his chariot and led, fled away on foot. So, you know, this part here, he, he, confused, he confused all of his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. Well, what that makes me think, before Barak shows up in the valley, all the horses have gone crazy and all the men have killed themselves, essentially. Because they all just start stabbing. They're all confused by the edge of the sword. I mean, they, they don't know who they're stabbing. They just know just stab, stab, stab. And they end up killing themselves. But what happens is, is Sisera, this great general, the one that should go down with the ship, the one that should lead his men, he jumps off his chariot like a little weasel. He scurries off into the wilderness, and he runs away from them. And so after he runs away, Barak, he pursues the chariots and the army, and he goes all the way to, to the, that word, to Haresh Hagiam. I'm going to need a nap after this. And the entire army of Sisera falls by the sword. Not even one single man is left. So, so this, is, this should be, I, I just can't do it justice as to what just happened here. An army of 300,000 people with 900 chariots, uh, iron chariots, they come down into a valley where they should win. God had previously flooded the valley. And then as Barak is running down the mountain, ready to fight to the death, before he even shows up, the horses have gone crazy and all the men have stabbed themselves with their own sword. I see Barak showing up and being like, we're here, everyone's dead. <laughs> you know, 10,000 Israelites are like, you know, looking around. So they probably, you know, check the bodies. And if someone's not all the way dead, or as Benjamin says, unalived. <laughs> so they, they made sure that not, not even one man was left. I mean, that, that's a miracle in and of itself. If you really, I mean, it's one thing to read it in the Bible and be like, words, 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 text, text, text. Okay, this happened. Don't really know what happened. Don't know the context. But when you kind of understand the context of it, it's like, that should have never happened. You know, the idea of, of God just confusing 300,000 people so that 10,000 people can win a battle. And then it continues with more like amazing stuff here. So Sisera, this is, you know, the weasel. Sis, okay, this is, where the, this is where the story, for me, gets really good. It's, I love this part. Sisera fled on foot to the tent of Jael. J Jael is a woman. And Sisera, he's running away. And remember that part earlier I talked about Heber, the, the Kenite? Well, so the Kenites had a good relationship with Jabin. And so Sisera is fleeing on foot, and he comes down, and he's like, oh, praise God. You know, boy, it probably wasn't praise God. He's like, oh, praise Baal or, you know, fertility God, whatever. And he sees this tent, and he says, we have a good relationship. I'm going to be saved. I'm going to be saved. I, man, I'm going to get away. I'm so lucky. This is just amazing. So he comes walking in there. And Jael, this, this woman, she comes out of her own tent. And Jael went out to meet Sisera. And she says to him, turn aside, my Lord. Turn aside to me. 
Have no fear. And so he turned aside to her. He goes into her tent. And she, this, I thought this was funny, she covers him with a rug. I get this image of uh, Sisera. I don't know how he led an army because he doesn't seem very smart here. Just laying on the ground and she covered him with a rug. But you can see the outline of his body. It's kind of like, you know, Wyatt. If Wyatt can't see you, then you don't exist. And so Sisera is like, you know, cover me up and then no one will be able to see me. And so Sisera gets covered here with this rug. He's hanging out in Jael's tent. And, and we're going to talk about how that shouldn't be happening anyway. But he says to her, a murmur through the rug. He says, I've been running for a long time. Please give me a little bit of water to drink because I am so thirsty. Now, what she does, instead of giving him water, she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink. And then she covered him back up. Now, when she opened a skin of milk, this was not, um, they had no refrigerator. This is not a difference between, you know, whole milk and 2% or, you know, full fat or whatever. This is, this is like curd. This is stuff you chew, basically. It's like thick curd, chewy milk, which, which after you've been running around, uh, running for your, from, from an army for your life, I don't know about you, but the last thing that I think I would want would be chunky milk, you know? That's what she gives him. Now, milk, as we would find out later on, but we don't have time to get into it, had this effect, the way that they made it, of like, it had this, this thing in it called tryptopan, which is like what turkey has, and so it makes you tired. And so Deborah gives him that. Now, at this point, we, Deborah's not like a Christian. She's not a Christ follower. She's not an Israelite. She's not like team God. She never even says anything in, in, this, in this story. But we know that she gives him milk. Now, she covers him back up. Now, while he's, before he goes to sleep, he, he says to her, Hey, stand at the door of the tent. And if any man comes and asks you, is there anyone in here? Tell him no. Now, I, I, again, I think this is funny because he says, stand at the door. So he's like, I, come on, Deborah, I'm, I'm under, or, come on, Jay, I'm under a rug. I mean, they can see that I'm here. Stand at the door, block the doorway, and if anyone comes and says, hey, is there a, you know, is there a general in there, a guy named Sisera? She's supposed to lean against, you know, the tent peg and be like, mm, no, don't know what you're talking about, you know. And then they look over her shoulder, what's under that rug? Mm, nothing. I don't know, nothing. That's essentially what he's asking her to do. And she says, okay, all right, I'll do that. And so Sisera... He falls asleep. Now look at what Jael does. But Jael, Heber's wife, takes a tent peg and a hammer in her hand, and she comes up quietly to him, and she drove the peg through his temple. It went through the temple into the ground, for he was sound asleep and exhausted. And just in case you don't quite understand that, the Bible says, <laughs> so he died. You know, like, you know it's like... Okay, just, you know, so you know, so he happened to die. She, she stapled his head to the ground, essentially, with a, with a tent peg. Now, this wasn't like you would get at Outdoor Warehouse where you have this, you know, little metal tent peg, you know, to put your tent in the ground. These were nomadic people that had decided to settle and, and stay put. Their tents were massive. Their tents were their houses. Their tents were, were permanent structures. And these pegs were meant to anchor these very heavy structures into the ground. And that's what she takes and she drives through his head. That's a, I mean, that's brutal. That's actually in the Bible. And so what, what a lot of people actually give J.O. criticism of, and it's, for one, it's like, I can't believe people criticize her for this, but, you know... <laughs> She had bad hospitality. This is, this is for real. You know, as I'm studying this, this thing, all these scholars and, and people of the, of the time said, you know, jail, this is, what she did was wrong because she had horrible hospitality. See, what you got to understand, in, the, in that Eastern culture, hospitality was a really, really big thing. And it really still is today. You would take in a stranger off the streets and place them in priority over your kids. And so she messed up here, according to a lot of people, because she took away her husband's exclusive right to host Sisera. 
So she stole something from her husband. He should have the right to do that. She, when she killed Sisera, she violates the covenant between Heber and Jabin. So she totally messed up that thing there, put her whole tribe in jeopardy. And then the third thing, by killing him, she violated his rights as a guest. Yeah, right? Like, you know, he had totally had the right to milk and lay it under a rug, and she violated that from him. But this is actually, it really is a big deal. I mean, it, it, it really is. For, for this culture, it's a big deal. And so I, after, you know, I just wanted you to understand that this is such a, a big deal, that, that jail's not this Christian, like, it's not her, her tribe, her village didn't come to her and say, you know, you're amazing for what you did. In fact, she would have really been pushing the potential of being exiled or being killed herself because this was such a big deal for them. And we don't exactly know why, why Jael did this to Sisera. But, and we don't know if it was inspired by God. We don't know that there's speculation that he had abused her when he came into the tent. There's all kinds of different speculation, but we don't actually know. So let's, let's look at the way this story ends here. And I've got a I've got to hurry because of time here. And so then Barak comes and he finds his way to the tent. He's pursuing Sisera and Jael comes out and she knows who Barak is. And she says, hey, you know, come on in and I'll show you the man whom you're seeing, who you're seeking. He's stapled to my floor. And he entered with her and behold, Sisera lay dead with the tent peg in his temple. And so it goes on here and it says, And so on that day, God subdued and humbled Jabin, king of Canaan, before the sons of Israel. And then it says that the hand of God just pressed down heavier and heavier and heavier on Jabin until he was conquered. And so what ends up happening here is, is this was the turning point for Israel. Deborah, a judge, put together a plan. And just as she predicted, it wasn't Barak that would take victory Brock, he doesn't, I don't even know if he gets to kill anybody at all. Everywhere he goes, the horses go crazy. They stab each other. He finally finds out where Sisera is. He's stapled to the floor. This is exactly what Deborah says. And it turns the tides for Israel. And over time, Israel frees themselves from Jabin. So now they're a free nation. So, so that's a, a, a great story. But what does, what does that matter to you? This is, this is the important part here. See, the Bible's amazing. It has these amazing stories. But what does this story mean to you? See, I, I don't want you to be discouraged in your life. See, Deborah was, or Jael was a tent maker. She grew up a tent maker. That was who she was. She was born into a culture where she made tents, period, done. That's what they did. Her sole purpose was to make a tent. She didn't travel and see the world she wasn't honored by uh, kings for her service. She was just a woman that made tents. And tent making was primarily a woman's work for this tribe, for this village. That's just what she was. And, and for, for a lot of us, you know, we have these, these, these thoughts of grandeur like, I wish I was more. I wish I could do more. I wish that, that I wasn't who I am. You know what? Every single one of us are born into a community, into a culture, into a situation that oftentimes determines who you are and who you become. And you can feel like you haven't had the same opportunities as other people. You can feel like that, that you don't have a lot to give, that you're just a lowly person. You've got one skill, one skill, you know, to your name. And that's kind of the only thing you know how to do. And it seems like it doesn't matter to anybody else in the world. It's just you and the little thing that you can do, and you had no uh, say in it. You were just born into it. And that can be a desperate feeling of like, man, I wish that there was more to my life. But see, just like in this story, this counts for your life as well. See, God didn't need the army, the general, or the warriors to end Sisera and mark the turning point between Israel and Jabin. See, God simply needed someone who was good with a tent peg and a hammer. That's how God turned the, the tides against Jabin to set Israel free. So you may consider yourself just a tent maker, but I want you to know that all God needed was someone that was good with a peg and a hammer. And through that, Israel was set free. Meaning, whatever your thing is, where you feel like you don't have a lot to give or enough to give, or you wish you were better or different, you, you know, all of those things that you may think, I want you to reframe it in your mind. That's your tent peg and your hammer. 
And you just need to get really good with what God's given you, your peg and your hammer. Because when God's ready, he'll use you to turn the tide in your life and somebody else's life. He'll use you for victory in ways that you never thought possible. He'll use you to do things that you could have never guessed that you would do. Because you're really good with a hammer and you're really good with a tent peg. So I hope that that's an encouraging story for you. I can't believe that that's in the Bible, but it is. It's fun. It it makes us laugh. It makes us giggle. It makes us kind of like, oh, man, that's kind of nasty, you know? But even in all of that, there's this amazing meaning that comes out of it, that no matter who you are and what you can do or what you can't do, when God wants to, he'll use you to change the world. So don't, don't look at your peg and your hammer and say, man, I don't have enough. Don't have enough to give. Because you have everything that you need. Because what you have is what God gave you. And so what what we're going to do this morning, we like to do this once a month, is we're going to take communion. And I just think that this is such a a special thing that we do. And it's so significant because, see, the God that made you to where all you needed was a peg and a hammer is the God that sent his son to die on the cross for you. So this morning, we're going to take communion in honor and in celebration of Jesus who died on the cross for us. So that we can all sit in this room right here and be confident in God's love for us and know that we've got our peg and our hammer and that's all we need and that Jesus has set us free. We are free indeed of all sin and we've been made right in God's eyes. See, God used Deborah, used judges to make Israel right in his eyes. And we don't have to wait on a judge. it's, It's a direct line because of what Jesus did for us. So I'm going to say a prayer for us, and then we're going to have some, some just ambiance, some, a video on. But during that time, come forward, grab uh, a cracker, grab a juice, grab your elements, and then you can take a seat again. And then I'll lead us through uh, taking communion, and then we'll, we'll close the service down. So I just would like to, um, I'm going to pray for us, and when I say amen, you guys can stand and get the elements. Lord, we just pray over this moment that we're about to take here in communion, and I just pray that you would tie it all together for us. I pray that... Uh, we would just take this excitement of the stories that, that we can read in the Bible, these actual events that happened and, and look.